Good evening. Thank you for joining me for our special edition of Redeemer Live on Wednesday nights. This is a five-part series called Truth for Troubled Times. And it's designed to help all of us meditate and then live according to the truths that we, we need during this time to shape our thinking and to shape our lives during this crisis. So we've looked at the gospel. We've looked at being productive. Last week, we had a special message from Dr. Del Huse on attacking anxiety, and I hope all of that has been helpful. We just need more truth during times like this. And today may be the most important truth that we're, we're going to look at for understanding what's really going on during these troubled times. So with this crisis lasting through May, I just want you to know you can expect us to be back here every Wednesday night in the month of May as well. I'm, I'm, and, and I'm happy to say this again, if times are tough for you, or if you think times are going to get tough for you, please let us know. Info at RedeemerAZ.org. That is info at RedeemerAZ.org. The people of Redeemer continue to be generous, and so we are able to help you, and we would love to. Info at RedeemerAZ.org. Now, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, that's page 1079 in the blue Bibles that we give away here at the church. Ephesians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, or if you are already there, join me in prayer before we get started as we look at this incredibly important truth from God's Word. Father, there are some truths that are right on the surface. They're easy to see, and they're easy for us to understand and apply to our lives. That is not today. Today is a truth that is, yes, easy to see, but it is hard for us to understand, which makes it hard for us to, to apply to our lives. And so we need you. I need you to be the one who's, who's preaching tonight. I need you to be the one who's speaking, who's teaching, who's guiding us into your truth, who's making your truth come alive, or actually making us come alive to your truth so that we get it. Your truth is living, your truth is active, it cuts to the very core of what we believe and what we, what we say we believe, so we need you tonight to do that cutting in our hearts. Please, as I pray often, open our eyes to behold the wonderful things that are found in your word. Do this for our good, please, and do this for the glory of your name, amen. So what is God doing during this pandemic? That was the question that I've been kind of teasing this series uh, or this teaching tonight. What is God doing during this t pandemic? Is he involved? If he is involved, how involved is he? Is he involved in everything? Is he involved in some things? Is he involved in not much at all? This gets us into the subject of God's control of our universe. Is he in control? How much control does he have? If he, is he in control of everything, or is he in control of just some things? Is he just sitting back and watching, or is he actively involved in what's going on in our world? Most treat this subject as a, a subject for debate and controversy, but listen, the Bible, it deals with this subject as a, as a subject for worship and for hope. And so I hope, that is, I hope that's the, the result for you today. And now, now some disclaimers before we get into this. God's control of the universe, like I prayed, really isn't hard to understand. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. It is kind of hard to understand. It's quite complicated. God's control isn't like addition and subtraction. It's, it's more theoretical physics, abstract mathematics with a, with a side of rocket science. Your Bible is the, the mind of an all-knowing God flawlessly expressed in human language. That's the Bible. The mind of an all-knowing, perfect God, perfectly expressed in human language. Whatever he communicate, communicates, therefore, because his mind is infinite, will have parts that are just hard for us to understand. We should expect that because this is, this is not a human document completely. Ultimately, the Bible is a divine supernatural document expressing the mind of an infinite God. So we're encountering the mystery of God's infinite mind. His, his thoughts are so far, far above ours that, that to think we can fully grasp any subject about God is futile. It's arrogant 
There are depths to this that we are never even going to scratch the surface of even the possibility of those depths existing. So I just, want to be, I just want to say, don't be afraid of that. It's really good for us to be stretched sometimes. But, but be afraid of a God who doesn't challenge you intellectually. Be afraid of a God who, who you can put your arms around completely and go, I, I've got him. I, I've mastered him. This is a subject that will bring us face to face with things that we cannot and will not fully understand. We will see the clear teaching in the text. Like I prayed, what, what the Bible says about God's control of, of, of the universe is absolutely clear. The issue is, how do we understand it and how do we apply it to our lives? Some of the Bible, you just need to know, is not going to reconcile the questions that you're going to have. Which means that, that we were never meant to fully understand these things. One old pastor that I know and love put it this way. He said, I'm happy to worship a God I never expect to comprehend. And, and, and that's Charles Spurgeon. He said that. And you know what? We just need to embrace that too. So, so I, I recommend that sentiment to you as well as we get started. The question I hope all of us are asking now and in the middle and at the end is not, do I understand God's control of the world? The question I hope all of us are going to be asking is, is God's control of the world, of the universe, taught in the Bible? And what does the Bible teach about the extent of God's control of the world? And if this is taught in the Bible, the, the next question is this, will I believe it only if I understand it? And will I believe it only if all of my questions are answered to my satisfaction? Or will I believe something simply because I see it clearly taught in the Bible? Those two questions, is it in the Bible? And will I believe it because I see it in the Bible? Those are the two questions I, I really want you to wrestle with today. Because we all come to this with filters and preconceived notions. So it's imperative that we just let the Bible speak and then submit to what we see there entirely. We have to come to everything in the Bible humbly and merely receive it, whether, whether it makes sense to us or not at the time, whether we like it or don't like it. Because as, we, as we've seen, every word of this book comes from God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And it means, that as, it means this, that we are, we are not God. Well, let me put it this way. All that means is that we aren't God when we can't harmonize these things. God can harmonize the things, the, the difficulties about his control. He can harmonize those things. The fact that we can't is just further proof that we're not God. And so with these disclaimers aside, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is a terrorist, anti-Christian terrorist turned missionary church planter. And he writes this letter called Ephesians it, it, because the, the church in Ephesus located in modern Turkey today, they, they got this letter, they read this letter, and then they probably passed it on to another church. And in chapter one, Paul writes this massive sentence that goes from chapter one, verse three, all the way to the end of chapter one, verse 14, one long sentence that would have driven his English teacher crazy. It's one long sentence about salvation, salvation arranged before creation. Salvation accomplished by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then salvation applied by the Spirit to individual people who turn from their sins and give their lives to Christ. And tucked right in the middle of that whole discussion, I think, is the strongest, most convincing text in the entire Bible. Not only on the fact of God's control of the universe, but the extent of God's control of the universe. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, drop down to verse 11. About God, this verse says, middle of the text, Him, the purpose of Him, that is God, who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this text phrase by phrase. So we can all see what the Bible says about just how involved, just how in control God actually is. So look back at verse 11. Let's start, let's start where the phrase starts. Let's start with the words, him who works. Stop right there. Give me a second to talk to the Bible nerds who are watching, okay? Bible nerds, listen up. The word work 
is in the present tense, which means that God's work is ongoing. It's continuous. It, it never stops. It, it's all, he is always working. Now, present tense aside, what does this word mean? This word means to implement. It means to, to put things into effect. So it means that God is ne- never stops implementing something. He's always accomplishing, always putting something into effect. Or the way that I put it for point number one, you must acknowledge that God is continuously active in our world. God is continually active, continuously active in our world. No breaks, no downtime. Psalm 121, God does not take a nap. He does not sleep. God is always at work. He rested on the seventh day from creating, but from that moment on, God has been actively, constantly working in his creation. John 5, 17, Jesus put it this way. He said, my father is working. Same root word as, as this word in Ephesians 1, 11. My father is always working until now. And he says, I, and I am working. So he's, he's constantly, always working. Hebrews 1.13 says Jesus is upholding the entire universe. Colossians 1.17 says he's holding everything together. Everything, every single thing he holds together. When I taught in the classroom, uh, I used to spend a, a lot of time studying authors who disagreed with me so that I, I could make sure that, that, I, that I conveyed their ideas, even though I didn't believe them, that I conveyed their ideas accurately. So a few years ago, I was teaching some seniors in, in high school, and I was teaching about deism, the, the idea that God created the universe, but he stepped back, and now it's, it's kind of running based on natural laws like gravity with, with no divine involvement whatsoever. So I taught the view, and I ended up teaching the view so well that, that half a dozen of the students in this senior Bible class at a Christian high school told me that I converted them to deism. Now, that's definitely not the outcome that Christian parents hope for when they send their kids to a Christian school. Now, eventually, actually the next day, all of them came back around. But Ephesians 1.11 answers deism, right? If God is always putting things into effect, he's not absent. He's not resting. He's not just watching things here. The universe isn't set on cruise control or autopilot while, while God is on a vacation, God God isn't working like we work, eight hours of work, 16 hours of of not work. He's working. There's not one second of the day when when God is not working, when he's not active. He's always implementing something, always putting something into effect. He's always realizing some goal that he set. His work isn't isn't lethargic. It isn't sporadic, moving from productivity to inefficiency and back to productivity. No, not him. No matter what is going on on in the world in general, in specific places in our planet, all the way down to every moment of our lives, God is at work, including in the crisis we are all in right now. He is implementing. He is active. He is putting something into effect. He is working. What, what you're seeing in the events of history is the outworking of God's work in the world. If you look outside your window tomorrow, there is nothing that your eye will see that God is not at work in. Same thing when you watch the news, a sporting event, whatever. He is not absent. He is not indifferent. He is not apathetic. He is continuously, constantly at work in our world. But don't miss what else Paul says in Ephesians 1.11. Look back at the text. The next question I want to ask is this. And it's the the next thing that Ephesians 1.11 answers. What is God implementing? What's he putting into effect? What's he doing when he's working? Look at the text. The answer is, it's everything. Look at the text. Him who works all things. He works all things. Stop there. Profound statement number one for, for today in this verse. Are you ready? Here's here's the profound truth. See that phrase, all things? It means all things. Notice too, God works all things. It doesn't say he works on all things. It doesn't say that he works like in all things. There there are those things out there and he's kind of tweaking it a little bit. Like he's tinkering away at the things that he made. Like, like we act, but he's constantly making course corrections. That's not what it says. The text says that, that God works all things. 
God is actually implementing all things. Everything that happens, he's doing it. Or the way that I put it for point number two, recognize God is constantly active in everything. We need to recognize that. When we look out at the world, when we watch the news, when, our, when our, 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 the feed comes up on social media, like God is constantly active in everything that we're seeing. How many things does verse 11 say God is constantly actively working in? How many? All things. Let that sink in for a second in your heart. Proverbs is all about wisdom for godly living defined, and, and that, that, that godly good life is defined by God. Wise people recognize that God is constantly active in everything. Listen to Proverbs 16, 4, quote, The Lord has made everything for its purpose. The word its in Hebrew can also be translated his. So if you have the NIV or the King James, they actually translate it that way. Listen to it this way. The Lord has made everything for his purpose. And that's what the Bible teaches everywhere. Romans 136, from him and through him and to him are all things. Everything that happens is, quote, from him, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. It's not just that he created all things, it's that he is active in every event, day by day, second by second. God is constantly active in, in every subatomic particle in the universe, he is active. Not one of them is outside of his control. If there is just one, think about Ephesians 1.11 in light of maybe just one subatomic particle outside of his control. Even if one atom is outside of his control, there would be a thing that's not included in the all things that he's working. But the text says he's working all things and that includes all things, all of them. Every single thing that is a thing God is working. So God is not working selectively. I'm going to work here, but I'm just going to let that kind of go and, and whatever happens, happens. He's not forgetful. He's not scatterbrained. He's not prone to daydreaming. He's not working in just the big things, but the normal everyday things. He's just kind of, oh yeah, whatever with that stuff. I'm, I'm too big. I'm, I'm just too, I, I'm too much for, for those little things. I'll take care of the big stuff. Listen, there's no big stuff compared to God. He is not working in just the presidents and the kings. He is working in every single one of our lives. And he is working constantly, continuously, always. He knows nothing of the division between secular and sacred. For him, everything is sacred. Everything falls under his control. Just listen to all the things the Bible says God is active in right now. This is just going to be, a, this is going to be a, a tsunami of truth for a second. Job 38 says he directs the planets and the stars. Matthew, Matthew 5 says it is, it is God who makes the sun rise and who makes it rain. Job 38, Psalm 135 says that God makes snow and wind and rain and clouds and lightning. I read, I read one author who said the Bible doesn't say it rained, but it always says God made it rain. Or, or it says God had not caused it to rain. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 104 says God makes the grass grow. Acts 14 says God makes crops grow. Jonah chapter 1 and 2 shows God's control over animals. Psalm 147 says animals have food because God gives it to them. Psalm 136 says the food that we eat is provided by God. Acts 14 says he takes care of our, need, our, our needs. Psalm 139 says that he's numbered our days. James 1.17 just summarizes it all and he says every single good thing that we have ever had is a gift from God. Job 12 says he raises up nations and brings them down. Daniel 2 says he installs some rulers and dethrones others. Psalm 75 says God makes people poor or rich. He makes some people great, other people low. Psalm 105.16, God called for a famine. Exodus 4.11 says, quote, the Lord said to Moses, Who's made man's mouth? We have no problem with that. God makes the mouth. But listen to this. Exodus 4.11. Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Let that sink in. Or this. Deuteronomy 32.39. God speaking. There is no God besides me. And then listen to what he says. I kill and I make alive. 
I wound, I heal, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. There is no one strong enough. There's, there's no one with the ability to stop me or subvert me. You can't do that. Amos 3, 6, rhetorical question. Answer is obvious. Listen to the text. Quote, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Answer, even disaster is under God's control. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Did you see that? It says that though we, we make plans, it's God who determines the plan that we're actually going to follow. Philippians 2 says that when you want to obey, God is at work. And when you actually obey, God is at work. Proverbs 6.33, seemingly random chance decisions like the flip of a coin or the roll of a dice actually come from God. Listen, Psalm six, uh, Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, the, the dice is rolled, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And don't forget, when we say everything, that includes salvation from sin, death, and hell. Romans 9.15, quote, I will have mercy, God speaking. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, a person's reception of mercy, God's expression of compassion, he says, it does not depend on, on human will. It does not depend on human exertion. But God's mercy, God's compassion, depends on God who has mercy. And then, finally, don't forget Acts 4.27. The first Christians, they're, they're praying. And it says, quote, In the city of Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, so that all of these people, Herod, Pilate, the Jews, the Gentiles, everybody, they, they were all uh, set up against your servant Jesus. Listen, Acts 4.28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Let that sink in for a second. God predestined. God determined the outcome beforehand. And then... His hand worked to bring about the most horrible sins ever committed on the face of the earth or ever will be committed on the face of the earth. The fear and the brutality of, of Pilate, the rejection and hatred of the Jewish leaders, the betrayal of Judas, the hiding of the disciples, the torture, mockery, and crucifixion by Roman soldiers of the kind, sinless, innocent Son of God. All of it done. Acts 2.23 according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. There is not one random, arbitrary thing going on down here on the earth. Nothing is based on luck or chance. Nothing is a fluke. God doesn't gamble. Nothing is accidental or unplanned. For the biblical writers, it is inconceivable that anything could happen apart from God working. They are regularly showing that he is the all-powerful determiner of everything that occurs. Psalm 119, 91, truly, quote, all things are God's servants. All of them are doing, every event is doing what God planned it to do. There is not one square inch of the universe where God is not working. There is no situation where God is not active. No blade of grass swaying. No piece of dust floating. From that to the toppling of governments, to, to depression, to a worldwide pandemic shutting everything down. The universal nature of God's work, as seen in Ephesians 1.11, means no matter what you're looking at, on TV, on the road, on your computer, on your x-ray, or just looking out your window, God is working in all of it, in everything. No matter what you're experiencing, if you're just watching ants, or if you're having a baby, or doing missions work, or going in for surgery, or just enjoying a glass of lemonade while the leaves rustle in the breeze, God is working, bringing all of that about, putting all of those things into effect. How many things? Ephesians 1.11, God is working all things. That means what? It means all things. 
In other words, there's ultimately one answer to the question, why did this happen? In ways we don't see and mostly will never understand. The, the ultimate truth as to why something happened is this. God is at work. If this is true, what events what events have happened or what events are happening in your life that, that need this reality check? Now that you see the truth in the Bible, what trials, what blessings do you, do you need to see afresh? Not as random, not as chance, not as, not as somebody doing that to me only. But to see it under the, the larger picture that God is at work ultimately involved in every single thing we experience. We'll look back at Ephesians 1.11. On what basis is God working all things? What is he working all things to accomplish? What's the goal? What's the plan? What's the direction? Notice Paul tells us that too, verse 11. God is constantly, always working, implementing, bringing about things, quote, according to the counsel of his will. Now, let's quickly break down every word. That word will there, you see it? God's will is his desires. It's, it's what he wants. It's, it's what he favors. It's, it's what he thinks is good. That, that's God's will. Look at the word counsel. When I hear the word counsel, I, I, I think of counseling. Like uh, getting insight or input from somebody about some issue in your life. That's not what this word counsel means here. God's counsel is not the process of getting input like give me counseling. God, this is not a process at all. This, this word speaks to a finished product. It's counsel as in the plan itself. It's the goals. It's the decision. It's the set purpose. It's the, it's the plan that God created. It's the outcome that God desires. That's his counsel in this verse. It's his plan. And then notice those words according to in verse 11. That, that means the counsel, the plan God wants is the standard. It's the measure, it's the pattern that he's working everything going on based on. That that is the plan. Everything going on is based on his plan. The New International Version of the Bible translates this in a way that's really helpful. Ephesians 1.11 says, God, quote, works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything is conforming to his will to the plan that he created, to what he wants. So God is working all things to match a plan he's already created. He's implementing trillions of things every second of every day to agree with decisions that he wants. God's universal, all things plan is being put into effect every second of every day based on a standard, a pattern. And that pattern, that plan is based on what? Notice the text. That plan is based on his will, Ephesians 1.11, what he wants. Or the way I put it for point number three, admit God is doing whatever he wants. Admit it. You look at that text, you can't get away from it. God is doing, constantly, actively working. He is doing whatever he wants. If you're wondering what it means for God to be in control, this is it. God does whatever God wants. Ephesians 1.11 is a very strong, forceful, emphatic, and clear statement about the absolute self-determination and unconditional freedom of God. This can be pretty shocking to our 21st century humanistic sensibilities. Does the Bible really teach this? Does it really teach that, that God is doing whatever he wants? Listen to Psalm 115.3. I'm going to repeat it so you can look it up. Psalm 115.3 says, quote, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. The New American Standard Translation captures this idea even more emphatically when it translates this verse like this. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Listen to Psalm 135, starting in verse 5. God's word says, quote, for, for I know that the Lord is great. Well, well what is that going to look like? He, he's great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Okay, so what is the evidence that he's great, and he's above all other gods? Answer, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Well, what's the scope of that? Is that just in heaven, or just in a couple pockets? No, 
Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth. Having plans, having a plan means that God is not disorganized. It means that there's nothing random at all. And though it might seem like it to us, there's no such thing as chaos. It also means that God is not apathetic about what's going on here. He's, he's implementing, he's working the plan that he wants in our world. Now before we move on, notice again those last two words in Ephesians 1.11. His will. In all things, God is working a plan that he is following and that plan is solely based on what he wants. He's not like the pagan gods who get surprised, get caught off guard, have to play catch up based on changing circumstances going on down here. Unlike most years, I know this year we've been praying for heat to to slow the spread of the virus. With summer comes, though, here in Arizona, with summer comes the monsoons. Huge fan of monsoons, as I'm sure many of you are. And and Psalm 135.7 says, quote, He, it is, who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the, for the rain and, and brings forth the wind from the storehouses. So the cloud, the wind, the rain, and the lightning, everything that goes into a monsoon, according to Psalm 135, 7, was made by God. That's the word. So when my kids like something. When we're doing something and my kids like it, they say more. So I, I, so I can tickle my son, I can, I can call in, I can, I can tickle my daughter Ava, and it's constantly, they will say, more, Dada, more, more. So they love it. That's one of the differences between kids and adults. Is that adults get sick of things, but kids can have the same thing over and over and over again and again and again. We're so mechanistic and scientific that we, we lose our wonder. When we should look at things like monsoons, or sunrises, or sunsets, and say more, more. Because that is God at work. And when things are evil, like wars or pandemics, we know from from Genesis 50, 20, that the same events that human beings mean for evil, God means those events to accomplish good. We never know a fraction of a percent of what those good things are. But we know from God's character that he is good. So therefore, everything he's going to do, even in evil events, is good. He is the best architect who draws up the best plans, and he is the best contractor executing those plans with intricate and intimate precision. Now look back at Ephesians 1.11. Notice his plan is not based on anything that happens outside of him. His plan is according to the purpose of his will, not Satan's will, not angel's will, not demon's will, not president's wills, not king's wills, not government's wills. And listen, not even our wills. His plans are according to his will. In other words, there is no one above God. God is not a servant to anyone, running around the universe, working all things according to the plan of uh, uh, somebody else's, based on somebody else's desires. At first glance, this might be a little unsettling to us, but shouldn't it really be a source of comfort? I mean, think about it. Being without our input means everything God is doing is not based on uh, our incomplete knowledge, our fickle desires, selfish motives, and error in judgment. I mean, would God really trust input for like running even a tiny part of the universe? Would he trust input from people who lose their keys, forget their passwords, change their minds all the time, and sometimes leave their drinks on top of their cars as they drive away? No. Instead, everything he's doing is based on his perfect knowledge, based on his flawless wisdom, based on his infinite love. And because no one is above him, God's control means he can guarantee that his plan will come to pass. That, that's, that's what prophecy is, right? It's not God making guesses. It's, it's God guaranteeing things are going to happen exactly as he says they're going to happen. And then he fulfills them as he literally says he's going to fulfill them hundreds of years beforehand. Prophecy is meaningless if God is not in control. And, and so is prayer. If God can't affect, and if he he can't even control what's happening, then then why do we pray for him to do it all the time? Please, in, in everything you're facing right now, listen. Satan is not in control. 
Your boss is not in control. Your diagnosis is not in control. Your spouse is not in control. Your kids are not in control. Our government is not in control. And listen, you are not in control. You have no control. God is in control. Now, one final thought flows from this truth, but it's not actually in the text of Ephesians 1.11, so we're going to have to go to other places to find it. But if God is working all things according to the counsel of his will, if he does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, and God is all-powerful, then point number four, realize God cannot be stopped. Realize God cannot be stopped. For the biblical writers, no one can force God to do anything And no one can keep God from doing anything that he wants to do. When you have a a narrative passage that looks like humans are kind of stopping God's will, it's not. That's not what it's teaching. It's God showing that he he always responds to people when they change. Just like, like, like when Nineveh repents, God relents. This isn't people changing God's mind. This isn't people overturning his will. Be careful that you don't take a text that describes what happens And and then make the jump to this is a universal principle. No, the universal principles are found in passages like like Ephesians 1.11, like New Testament letters, where God works all things according to the counsel of his will and nobody else's, just his. He does whatever it is that pleases him every second of every day. Nothing, not demons, not people, no thing can keep God from doing what he wants. No one can stop him. Now, I don't want you just to believe that because I said it. I want you to hear it for yourself. I give you these verses. Actually, if you're taking notes, I put all the verses I'm going to say on your notes. Underneath point number four. So you don't have to write them down. You can just listen and then go back later. Listen to these texts. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 6 says, quote, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. You rule over all of them. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. That word withstand means to defend themselves. That no one can defend themselves against you. Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things. That's omnipotence. You can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That word means prevented or defeated. No purpose you have can be defeated. That is somebody in Job, listen, who did not have any book of the Bible, but knew that truth, that nothing can stop God. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel, the plan of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations, they stand there. His plans are firm Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. Isaiah 14, 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? Who will stop it? Who will cancel it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Rhetorical question, answer, that's impossible. Nobody can turn it back. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel, my plan shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. And then finally, Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. This is Daniel speaking. He's praying. He says, I bless the Most High God, praised and honor him who lived forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will. Listen, here is is Nebuchadnezzar, went crazy, back in his right mind, And when he is in his right mind, when he is thinking clearly, rationally, this is what he says. God does according to his will in the hosts of heaven, that's stars and planets and all of that, in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can stay his hand. No one can can restrain his hand. No one can say to him, what have you done? 
There's no one above him. There's no one stronger than him. So nobody can stop him. Do you feel the weight of those passages? Are you letting that truth sink in? This past Sunday, I talked about my, one of my kids who says why a lot. And, and last week, last Sunday was the why sermon. This, this message is the what about sermon. Because if you're not letting these truths sink in, what's happening in your head right now is you're going, well, what about, what about, what about? No one can withstand God. His plan cannot be defeated. His plan stands forever. No one can overrule him. No one can reverse him. No one can restrain him. God cannot be stopped. He will never be stopped. Stopping him is impossible. He will accomplish, not some or most, he will accomplish all of his plans and all of his desires. Not one of them will fail. And Ephesians 1.11 says, all things, everything, falls into that plan. This is what it means for God to be in control. He will do every single thing he wants to do because he is in control. He does whatever he pleases. This is what it means to be God. Now, I know you probably have tons of questions. Like I said, it's the the what about stuff. What about free will? What about sin? What about evil? What about natural evil like viruses? What about moral evil like, like, like murder? Listen, God is in control of all of it. And he's in control of it in such a way that he is not responsible for evil, even though he may have tens of thousands of reasons for the evil. He is good. He remains good. And he's in control of evil in such a way that when it comes to moral evil, human beings are responsible for that evil, while he is not. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He is wise. And he is good. He cannot look on evil with approval. And God God doesn't need us to get him off the hook for how he controls evil in the world. God has the power to stop evil, and he doesn't. So whether he causes it or whether he allows it, evil exists. Which means it's part of the all things in Ephesians 1.11 that he's working in his plan. If you need more on this subject, if if you want to know more, you want to dig deeper on this, Check out the books that I recommend. Just, just download the, the, uh, the message notes and you'll see in the bottom right hand corner uh, a group of books that I recommend for you if you want to go deeper on this. Now as I conclude, don't forget, we'll be back in Titus 2 on Saturday at 5 p.m. Arizona time and Sunday at 9 a.m. Arizona time. If you need help with anything, let me remind you, email us, info at redeemeraz.org. So my goal tonight has not been to answer all your questions. My goal tonight has been to teach you what the Bible says about God's control in every situation, including the situation we are facing right now in this worldwide pandemic. Now, it's not just, it's not just that the idea is biblical. I hope that after today that you're going to see that is, that you're going to see the practical effects of this truth. That, that, that if you really embrace this, this will change the way you view reality. It'll change the way you view everything. And, and truly, it will cause you to worship. And it will cause you to trust in the heart of God. When things are black and they don't make sense and it's, and, and it's confusing and, 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 and the, the clouds are, are just pouring on our lives. What, how does the saying go? Behind a frowning providence... He hides a smiling face. Child of God, you can hold on to that. You, let me put it this way. You cannot hold on to that if God is not in control of all things. The only way that you can have hope in troubled times is if God is in control of everything. So when my son Colin was learning to swim, he, he, he did a great job, but he also had some scary moments. And so to protect him, we put on his floaty, We did this with my daughter Ava too. We put on this this harness thing that goes over their arms and straps around their waist and it forced their neck and their their head to be above water and and it kept them safe. Listen, in the scary moments of our lives, like what's going on with this virus? Will we lose our business? Will I lose my job? Will we lose our house? Will we have enough to pay our bills? Where is the culture headed? Why is my child acting that way? Or a million other real concerns that all of us have. 
in those moments, this truth that God is continuously, constantly in control of all things. He's doing whatever his good heart wants. He is doing those things with perfect, flawless wisdom. And, and all of those things, all of his working can never be stopped. This truth means the universe is, is not careening out of control with a terrified God wishing he could stop it and wondering where is it going to crash and, and how can he, what can he do with the carnage that's left over. No, in these painful, uncertain, troubled times, God's control can guard your heart. It can redirect your thoughts to truth. It can keep your head above the waters of despair. This truth can be an an anchor for your soul in the midst of adversity if you let it. This truth can, can also cause eruptions of gratitude and prosperity if you let it. This truth can be your confidence in prayer and in evangelism if you let it. One pastor wrote that to believe with all of your heart in God's control of all things, quote, is to enjoy heaven on earth. I hope that this truth will give you that in these troubled times. Let's pray. God, that's my hope for myself. That's my hope for everybody watching. That the the questions that this truth causes, while important and significant, will also melt away a little bit as we simply take what your word says as true. And we don't try to rationalize it. We don't try to explain it away. we We don't try to what about it. But we just, in humility, accept it. And then try to work out our questions from there. God, that's not going to happen without you. So please help us to understand your word. And please help us to understand how this truth, how this truth can, can deeply and richly guide our thoughts and guide our hearts, guide our desires, guide our emotions during the crazy times we're seeing take place in front of our eyes. We need you for that, Father. So please help us. Help each of us, I pray.